uh, every week I've been going into uh, Washington, D.C. And, and having taking meetings. And uh, I have some very important news. Um, there are uh, both a Senate and a House bill that will be part of the Defense Authorization Act uh, that goes through this fall that provides explicit, specific whistleblower and uh, protection and release or a vehicle for uh, witnesses who, in the military or contracting world or intelligence world who've been involved in these covert uh, UFO project programs to legally share their information. Mm -hmm. um, now we sent out something about that. And as a result, a very senior Air Force officer, now retired, contacted me, who has very in-depth knowledge and involvement with this. And he said, he's been watching what we've been doing with the Disclosure Project for 20 years and has kept his powder dry until we were able to get this move through and that's going to go through in, in another month or two a couple months so this is extremely good news but it's important that all of us share this youtube a link because you never know who's out there who's been following this waiting for this moment right no remember the presidents and the ci directors and the, these sort of people i briefed in the past didn't want to go this far the folks who are running the investigation inside the government now do and they are going this far. So this is a game changer. In 32 years of doing this, as the, the founder of the Global Disclosure Project movement, I've never seen anything like this in terms of its potential. This is really um, good work. Really now there's, a, there's a door is opened, and the, we better move through that door because it could slam shut again. Um, so I encourage people to share this information with everyone they know. You never know who is in your network of friends, family, uh, work associates who are, in fact, um, people who have had some involvement with this issue, who have been sitting on the fence or waiting for a safe vehicle, a safe way to move their, their knowledge forward and to end the criminal programs keeping this secret. And by the way, 99% of everyone involved in those projects don't know that they're being run illegally. They don't? No, they have no idea. Only the very top echelon. So re let me explain something to folks. Most people are sort of cogs in a very big machine in these beyond black, unacknowledged special access projects mm -hmm. because most of them don't know what I learned in 1993 when I briefed the director of the CIA. Mm -hmm. And that is that Beginning in 1956 or so, the U.S., the constitutional government of the United States was decapitated. President, senior folks were actually being deceived and moved out of an organization that arrogated to itself the right to work on this issue, but not inform the constitutional leaders in the White House or the Congress. So those projects went completely rogue let's say, in the late 50s. This is why Eisenhower in 1961, when he left office, said, beware the military industrial complex. Now, the very good news is that there are extremely senior people now in the US government that we've given actionable intelligence to who now know that that is true and not some you know, subculture conspiracy theory nonsense. So they know for a fact it's true, but the implications of it Obviously, or there are people who have worked for a period of time or episodically, or maybe they were, had an incidental event that they saw. They don't know that these projects, they, you know, they were told, keep this secret, sign this 70-year non-disclosure agreement. And they thought they were signing on to a legally sanctioned, even if it was a black project, a le legally sanctioned black project, right? Now, I have been meeting with people who manage the black budget of the United States who denied access to these projects. That's more proof of what I said in the 90s after briefing the CIA director and after a brief, the head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Wilson, and the head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, on and on and on. 
and members of the Senate Intelligence Committee, even in the 90s, they all said, look, we know nothing about this. So there's no way those projects are being run legally if the president, the CIA director, the secretary of defense, the people in charge of the Pentagon at that level can't get access to and are threatened. Admiral Wilson admitted he was threatened mm -hmm. with the motion. And he told me worse if he kept pushing on it. There's a former member of Congress who at the time was a member of Congress that I briefed. I found out about a month ago, two months ago, that a, a couple of guys showed up and threatened to kill him and his family if he pursued this any further. Now, that's another reason why we're putting this in place to also protect, to get a, a protection for these whistleblowers. So we're not only providing people who have their non-disclosure agreements and security oaths, uh, whistleblower protection, as well as a mechanism around those, and often cases, they literally signed 70 year secrecy agreements, but we're also uh, providing a mechanism for them to be protected uh, physically and eventually financially as well, if, if that's in play. So I think this is why, whether you're on the corporate side of it with a, a contractor or military or intelligence or other government agency, you need to contact us at SiriusDisclosure.com, S-I-R-I-U-S Disclosure.com. And there is actually a box on the contact bar for witnesses, military corporate witnesses. Um, it's very important because this is a very, very big development um, and the support is now there and there's a mechanism there. And it has to happen, I think, pretty efficiently in the next year or so, because I don't know that the window is going to be open for much longer than that. So I think, you know, time is of the essence. Yeah, I think so. And that's yeah. huge news. I mean, that's, that's so much different than what it's been in the past. Oh yeah. There's nothing like it. I, I mean, I'm in DC every week and have been for decades and, and I've never, you know, this is by far the most promising um, movement forward. And by the way, it's, it's totally separate from that office at the Pentagon or, you know, that sort of dog and pony. So clueless open hearings that happened a couple months ago that were a, frankly, a charade. Right. Um, because the guys who were there testifying didn't even know what the Maelstrom Nuclear Strategic Air Command uh, nuclear case was, which is, of course, multiple disclosure project witnesses and, and official U.S. government documents that we published in 2001, okay, 20 year, 21 years ago. So you're, you're dealing with people who are where it's really just sort of a, a storefront, mm -hmm. <laughs> But there's another thing going on. What I'm trying to tell people without saying what I cannot go into details on is that there's something else going on that's very profound and very effective. And I'm sure they wonder how you know all this stuff. Well, <laughs> look, it's, it's 32 years of hard work and over you know, a thousand or more top secret guys who give me information, documents, facilities, project code names, the locations of underground work areas, on and on and on and on. And I'm conveying all of that to these people, every shred of it. All it's the a process. Archive. Yeah, we're in the process of, of, of getting my archive properly digitally scanned and organized so that it can be put into a massive um, archive for uh, these folks. It's Someday, amazing. maybe we'll make it available to the public if we had enough. Well, you, again, we're doing this with all volunteers, so. Nice. but it's um you know I've, I've told them i don't want any official u.s government uh, supporter funding i want to stay fiercely independent which i've always been yeah, uh, it's, the, it's, sort of, it's so not washington because everyone has their hand out um but i said yeah the, I, those things come with very big strings and ropes that tie you up no thank you I'm fierce, as you know, Pat, I'm fiercely independent. I will not be corrupted. Um, you know, I walked away from the head of uh, General Stubblebein offered me $2 billion. He was the head of Army Intelligence and the Special Forces in 1992. And he offered me personally $2 billion to betray what we're doing. I said, no, thank you. So I think that this is something that people have to understand the kinds of threats that are scary and bribes that are substantial 
that have corrupted this process since the late 1950s. Um, lethal force has been used and a lot of money. You know, remember, I met with a member of this committee that runs these covert programs in uh, 1993, prior to briefing the director of the CIA, where he said, we have paid at least 10,000 people $10 million each or more yeah. to secure their cooperation with what we're doing. And then he offered me another kind of bribe. So I think that that's real. It's outrageous. Um, but look, a lot of people for that kind of money will say, oh, yeah, sure, great. You know, they'd sell their grandmother under the bus for that. There's or if they're threatened, you know, I mean, th th this is why I tell people the currency that matters in this is integrity, honesty, courage, perseverance. The, the, these, these people I'm working with in DC, they have all that. We've gone round and round. So they're going the distance and they're very courageous people. Um, Glad to hear that, yeah. Yeah, but they're not, they're not just, they're not the political class, lawyer class of, you know, kind of, Nancying around folks. These are people who've done special operations. They've done uh, very courageous things. They understand the risks. Um, they have the ability to go the distance legally now. And so far, they're going the distance. So while that door is open, I'm making an appeal to everyone who's listening, who's concerned about uh, this kind of illegal secrecy. Remember, this group is a transnational group that's global, that responds to no legal government anywhere in the world, that have technologies thousands of years more advanced than anything the mainstream legal constitutional government of the United States or China or Russia or Great Britain or France have. So um, that's what you're dealing with. And I'm, I don't sugarcoat the challenge. It's Welcome to Tucker Carlson. Today, the crazy thing about the topic of UFOs is how, when you get into it, how really non-crazy a lot of the people who know a lot about the topic turn out to be. They're kind of the opposite of what you imagine. They're not for conspiracy nuts. A lot of them are just scientists. Um, Gary Nolan is definitely at the top of that list. He's a Harvard, he's a Stanford rather professor, Stanford PhD, he's an immunologist. And he has, over the last decade or two spent a lot of time studying the harmful effects that apparent encounters with UFOs have on the human brain. This is a field of study and he is at the very top of it. Dr. Gary Nolan joins us in studio. Professor, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you so much. <laughs> this is, I was just reading your, your, again, I just, to restate the same point once more, it's just remarkable once you get into this topic I don't know if mainstream is the word, but it's not fringe at all. So just to kind of to, to, to accentuate that point, explain your background for our viewers, if you would. So my main job, my day job at Stanford for the last 30 years uh, has been the development of technologies to look at cancer and blood. And so we've spun a number of companies and sold a number of companies that we started out of my lab. Two of them are actually on NASDAQ. And the idea has always been that if money is coming in from the NIH, we should give back to the public. And so in the process of developing some of these, we developed uh, an instrument called CYTOF, which is really all about studying blood cells at a deeper level than anybody's been able to do before. And so it was circa 2011 or so uh, when some people from the CIA uh, and an aerospace company came to me uh, to ask me for their help uh, on the analysis of some individuals who had been had encountered some anomalous objects, they said. And I mean, they came to my office unannounced uh, and then started laying out pictures and data on the table in front of me. And I honestly thought it was a joke. I thought it was Wait, so you're a Stanford camera. professor, an immunologist doing medical research and building mm -hmm. companies. And all of a sudden, one day, the CIA shows up at your office? Because they had asked around and said, OK, we have these people who've been injured. 
And one of the things that they wanted to do in a complete medical workup of these individuals was to look at the blood. It's a natural thing to do. If you're looking for an inflammation, the blood is one of the places you might look to get a sort of a more complete list of everything that's going on in the body. And so that's when somebody said, well, if you want to do this, do it properly, you got to go talk to this guy, Nolan, at Stanford, because he has the world's best instrument that he's developed for doing it. And that's what started it. So what was your view of UFOs, UAPs at the time? You know, I was kind of a science fiction fan, and I was interested in it as any mainstream individual might have been. But it wasn't something that I, has, I had any kind of focus on in my so life. So you had no deep knowledge of the topic? No deep knowledge. Were you surprised that a U.S. government agency was doing this kind of work? I mean, presumably, the question was settled for them. They didn't yeah. wonder if UFOs were real. They knew at that point, right? Right, right. No, of course. I mean, I, like I, I said, I mean, at first I thought it was a joke. I mean, I really thought that I was being, somebody was about to put me on candid camera and make a joke of it. Uh, but as they started showing me the data and they were deadly serious, I mean, I tried to s lure them into making a joke about it. They were deadly serious about it because they had basically said at that point, people have died. Um, and uh, so, and then they showed me some brain images of individuals uh, who had been damaged and internal scarring you can see through MRIs. And, you know, it's data. It's, it's unmistakable. You have to say, okay, well, what did that? Uh, I can conjecture or hypothesize about, you know, is it the Russians? Is it UFOs or whatever? But the fact is there is data that says something is happening. And so we need to study it. And that's what a scientist should do. So, of course. Oh, absolutely. But so for some context, who were these people who had been injured um, or killed? Oh, they were military personnel, uh, people, intelligence agents uh, on the ground, uh, a pilot, uh, a few pilots, actually, um, who had gotten close enough and they had some sort of effects. Uh, who gotten close enough to some sort to of some unknown sort of aircraft. Object, some sort of object. One of them on the ground as well, walked right up to it and touched it. And uh, actually his case is pretty famous and even Senator McCain was able to come in and help this individual because the army was denying him, was it the army or the air force, was denying him medical benefits. And so eventually it reached the office of, Do of uh, Senator McCain and he stepped in and forced the Veterans Affairs he to do something. He walked up and touched it? Can, can you back up and just tell, what was the story there? I'm that was the so-called Rendlesham Forest case in England where yes. objects were seen uh, over the bunkers where the nuclear weapons were stored. Uh, and things in were seen- In the 70s. In the 70s or so, yeah. There's quite a few documentaries on it. So, but the individuals who were actually there, I know one of them quite well. Uh, and uh, he was the person who was basically denied benefits. And his medical records were uh, classified for quite a while. They wouldn't let anything out about him. Why? So he touched this object. Yeah. What would, did he describe the object? Yeah, he described the object as basically about four or five feet across with strange writing on it. I don't know. I mean, it's a, you know, it's a long time story. It's not something that I, I don't try too much to get into the stories and to the ancient literature because there's so many arguments and mis and disinformation about it. I'm more interested in let's collect new data uh, and study it, right? Let's collate the data in a way and try to convince other scientists that the data is real, not that a conclusion is real. So right. I try to stay away from that because there's plenty of arguments and historians who yes. want to do that. So you stay right in your lane. I stay in my lane because that's what I'm good at. Yes, so good call. Just stay away from it. Because so so this, this man specifically, mm -hmm. military personnel who touched this object, in the woods near a nuclear bunker in Great Britain, what happened to him? Uh, he had all kinds of, he had nauseous, he had long-term consequences to his heart. Uh, now whether any of this was directly caused by the object or not is open to debate. But in the immediate aftermath of the interaction that he had with it, uh, there were medical consequences. So you'd have to imagine that, the, you know, that somewhere back then something happened to him that he's still dealing with years later. I mean, long COVID as an example. of yes. There can be a traumatic incident that occurs to your body and later on you're still dealing with it. Well, with many of those. But part of the issue with him was sort of a PTSD that nobody would uh, believe him. 
right? And then when he tried to follow up uh, it with the Veterans Affairs uh, Office, the medical offices, they just denied him coverage, which was ridiculous, you know, because he was he served his country, and yet they were ignoring him. But the CIA believed him, it sounds like. Yes. Well, what happened is that a number of cases uh, like this started becoming known, right? And so what happens is that these cases and events kind of trickle up the chain and then get moved across the DOD uh, and put in a bucket, you know, let's just call it the weird bucket, until enough of them have occurred that somebody says, okay, there's, there's uh, something we should be paying attention to. Havana syndrome is an example of that, right? That enough individuals in diplomatic offices, et cetera, were getting sick, and so there was a pattern beginning to occur and emerge, and so somebody realized, okay, that there's, somebody is probably attacking our personnel in these offices. Uh, the diplomatic corps, et cetera. So those cases all end up over in a bucket where eventually somebody pays attention to it. And that was what then instigated them to come to me. Interesting. So how many cases, about roughly? A, about 100. 100? Yeah. Now, of those, about probably 80 to 90% of them ended up being actually Havana syndrome. So as we were studying these cases, um, the guy who was doing the work, his name is Kit Green. He's a neurophysiologist and is also associated with the CIA, uh, used to be in the CIA. Um, he was going back to what are called the diagnostic codes because, you know, when, when you have a new medical issue, you start saying, okay, well, what happened to them? This, they've got this kind of phenomena. They've got this kind of problem with their lungs. And they've got inflammation of the skin, et cetera. And you, you put them into these codes. And so it was around 2015, 2016 that, and we had at the, up to that point in time called this interference syndrome. Something was interfering with these individuals. Uh, but then it became obvious that the diplomatic core issues were happening and that many of the symptoms in those individuals, in the Havana syndrome individuals, matched some of the, or most of the symptoms that we had in our big bucket. Why? Because they were in the weird bucket at the time and they just ended up being Havana syndrome, but that was good in a way because we were able to take those individuals out and out of consideration. I didn't have to worry about them anymore. It now became a national security concern. But the people who were remaining were the really interesting ones to me because those are the people who claim to have interactions with UAPs, right? So it was kind of like in science, you first characterize, you collate into categories. Yes. The categories that are understood, you just step aside and put them aside and they're handed off. Now it's a huge operation in the government to deal with those. In fact, the uh, Senate Intelligence Committee just came out with a report this morning that has language specifically in it to look at the Havana syndrome cases and to understand it. Um, it also has interesting, I don't know if you saw it, it also has language about UAPs and basically uh, admonishing the Defense Department saying, you guys have been dragging your feet, uh, no, no more whistleblower language, uh, they actually, there was also a, a situation where they want to go all the way back to 1947, collect, they want the, all the Defense Department and the CIA, et cetera, to collect all the information around uh, events that have occurred. They want all of, interestingly, the, N, the NDAs, the non-disclosure agreements, they want those all listed because the NDAs are associated to people, and that means they can start to name the people who have been involved they want all of the information on the disinformation and the obfuscation that's been going on. And they want information about the medical harms that have occurred. Right. And that's all, in, that's all in the National Defense Appropriations Act uh, for 2023. It's, so this yeah. is way outside your lane, but since you've had so much experience dealing with all the people involved, maybe you have a theory. Why do you think DOD or the U.S. government more broadly has lied about this for so long? So... Um, well, I think that they were just afraid of admitting that they don't have control over the airspace. Yeah. That's one thing. But also, it's really back to what it is that I was saying before. We have the data, but we have, or the, to the extent that there is proof that there's something else here, uh, they didn't want anybody to know about it because they're scared of what the reaction might be. Yeah. No, it makes sense. I mean, I mean that's, that's a human reaction. It's a human reaction. Yes. But... The other point is, I think it's important to realize, is that when a lot of, let's say, these events were occurring and there's claimed 
crash materials that might have been uh, collected. This went off to places like Lockheed and all of the big aerospace companies. They wanted to profit off of it. And many of them basically took a, a lot of the information, set it aside, and they decided, okay, well, we're going to profit about, off it. We're not going to tell Congress what this is all about, because if we do, then maybe we have to share this with McDonnell Douglas or some. How, how could an, so if an aerospace, and I've heard this theory from very informed people, I don't think it's a theory, it sounds true, that if there are crash materials, and apparently there are, there are, those reside in the custody of not the U.S. government, but of exactly. contractors that work for the U.S. government, aerospace, defense contract. Right. McDonnell Douglas, Lockheed, et cetera. How could they profit off those materials? Well, one, they can continue to ask for black budget money. Oh. For it. <laughs> I, mean, I should know this. I lived in Washington, right? Right. I mean, that's, the funding continues. The funding can continue. You might hope eventually that you can understand it, right? But uh, and thereby profit off of it, you know. But my point has been that whatever this stuff is, is hundreds of technology revolutions ahead of us, and understandings of physics that we don't appreciate. Right. So it's kind of like, I mean, the old saw is send a cell phone back to a Neanderthal and see what he does with it. <laughs> you know, pound rocks. It eats it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so No, it's totally right. Um, fascinating. So it sounds like in the world that you live in, it is taken for granted, which is assumed to be true, that this stuff is, is real. Yes. Yeah, it's 100% real. I mean, there's just no doubt about it. I mean, the data is real. And this is what I, when I have these conversations with other scientists who have told me, Gary, you're going to ruin your reputation. It's like, well, I, I, I've my reputation has been always going against the grain and look at where I am. I'm perfectly fine going against the grain. Uh, this is real and we need to pay attention to it and it's just unscientific to not study it. Yes, amen. Right? I mean, it's just wrong. And if you're going to be that way, you're a priest, you're not a scientist. Amen. Thank you for saying that. I feel that way about a lot of things um, that touch science, uh, but this is definitely mm -hmm. one of them. So why, so why would the aerospace company that you have not named, I've noticed, uh, why would they be interested in finding, along with the CIA, the answers to these questions? Technology. I mean, if, I mean you've seen the reports on how these things move. Zero to 5,000 miles an hour, instantaneous acceleration and deceleration, transmedium travel. Yeah. Me meaning from air to water. Air to water. Yeah. We can't do any of that. We just can't. And we, moreover, we don't know how it's done. We don't know how it's done. And so that means that there's a level of physics that can be appreciated and maybe taken advantage of. I mean, hundreds, thousands of years ago, we looked at birds and we saw they could fly and we said, we want to fly. So now we see this happening and now we realize that our physics doesn't answer how that moves. So we need new physics. And so that to me is the most important aspect of this. But if we go back to like where my career came from, I always look at data and say, what can I do with this and make something out of it to give back? What technology can I create that can be used by everybody? So similarly, I look at these materials, and I do have some public materials, and I say, if I can understand these at the atomic level and understand how these things are put together, I might not understand how anti-gravity works, but I can now bring in scientists who might be experts in the kinds of atoms that are there and say, tell me what this might have been used for, because this is where it came from. But I mean, all of it was sort of like alighting around the central question, which is like, who, who made these? Who are these people, these things? What is this force? Yeah. Not human. I, I don't know. I mean, and that's why it's so hard for me not to say what I think it really is. Because if, if I do say it is absolutely this, people will start to question. Of course. Because well, you can't know, right? Right. But, but I think the better way to do it is to convince people that the data is real. Wait, can we let's move back just one sentence? Yeah. So without putting your professional credibility, reputation on the line, et cetera, you're around people who study this stuff for a living, who are right. the most knowledgeable people on this topic in the yes. world. Yes. What is their general sense of what this might be? That this is not from Earth. Right. That it's not from Earth, that this right. is some, um, these are aliens, right. essentially. And, you know, un until... I see a piece of technology that does something I don't understand, or until I see an alien body, I'm going to also remain skeptical. Of course, as you should. But it doesn't mean I won't study it. 
People say, well, why, if you are so skeptical still, you're studying it? Because it's the most important thing that could have ever... <laughs> of course, but that's why we cover it on this show. Not because I, I have no special knowledge. I know right. nothing, really. But why could... by definition, yeah. it's the most important. So is the general belief that these objects, these whatever this is, is coming from outside our atmosphere or that it's coming from beneath the oceans? Uh, both, I think. I mean, whatever it is, it's clearly been here for a long time. And it doesn't necessarily care so much about us, but it, uh, in terms of, you know, if it wanted to wipe us out, it could. Clearly, I mean, obviously. All you got to do is go out to the asteroid belt and push a big rock our way, and that's the end of us. We're the next dinosaur yes. you know, uh, problem. Um, so the next question is, well, if they've been here all along, before we were even civilized, well, whose planet is this really? And do you think that there is evidence that this is a... a, a, a an ongoing thing. This yeah. is yeah, yeah. I mean, so I don't know if you know the the um, uh, the astronomer and venture capitalist Jacques Vallée. You probably heard of so, him. Of course, yes. And so he's actually a good friend. Uh, and uh, you know, he's written books about the matter, showing that if you go back into the historical records, things written by the scientists and philosophers and mayors and kings of the day, you know, it's, it's in the record. This object was seen, it looked like a wheel, or it looked like a shield, and it showed up over our battles, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So you can go back and recontext the observations and say, well, as, if somebody wrote that today, I'd call it a UFO or a UAP, right? Well, so, of course. So it's been here. I, I think really, you know, one thing you have to ask is, well, why do they show up? And maybe it's just, and, and why don't they land, that's a question I often get asked, is, well, why would you? I mean, do you, do you try to establish diplomatic relations with the ants in your garden when you move into a new house? <laughs> right. No. You do what you want, and you dig up the yard, and you do as you please. You try not to interfere with them. You know, if there's a nest of birds, you're not going to interfere. You're going to try not to bother them. So, because you've got your own business going on. You're doing your own thing. So, what that thing is, I don't know. There does seem to be some connection between nuclear power, nuclear weapons, yeah. nuclear fission itself, and these objects. I mean, mm -hmm. just, have you, you clearly noticed this? Yes. Well, I think if you ask yourself the question, how could we negatively interact with them, right? I mean, there's probably little that even they could do if we blew up a, no a nuclear bomb around them. So to the extent that we have reached a level of technological capability where we can be a problem to them, nuclear weapons are one of them, right? I mean, but look as far as where we're going to be a thousand years from now. We're starting to move out into, like with Elon Musk, into Mars. Maybe someday we'll be able to travel to other solar systems even by conventional means. Um, so if you are uh, an emerging species uh, in this area of the galaxy and there are elders running around, maybe they want to pay attention to the monkeys who, you know, are usually throwing mud up against each other on the walls and stuff. No, it's a completely... Does this bother you at all? No. I think it's exciting. I, I mean, why would it bother me? I mean, because I don't think that they're here necessarily to harm us. And if they want to, they can. So nothing I have any control over. So is there any evidence of the 100 cases that you've looked at that, that any of those human beings were harmed on purpose? No. I think it's just as bad. Like you just, if you happen to walk across an airfield and get in the way of the exhaust plume of a jet engine, you're going to get harmed. Um, before I ask you to describe the, what those harms are, because mm -hmm. you, you've seen strong yeah. patterns, right, yeah. in the harms, yeah. um, there are innumerable first-person accounts of people who say, claim they have been taken into some mm -hmm. craft and experimented mm -hmm. upon. Right. Have you come across those, and how do you assess them? I come across those, but I, you know, have a hard time. It's like what I was saying before. I, it's an encounter. It's an experience. But whether those experiences are real or whether or not they're imposed on these individuals as sort of a, 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 an altered reality memory. I don't know. I mean, here's an example. There's a great case. Uh, it's in France 
uh, this family, this is just within the last few years, driving down the highway, uh, a mother and two children in the back. They have an open top car during the day, a uh, crowded, crowded uh, highway. They see over their head through the window a craft. I mean, it's, it's obvious. And, like, and then she's looking around, the mother's looking around and saying, and noticing that nobody else seems to see this. Okay? So the kids in the back have a camera, a phone, you know, a phone, take a picture. When they get home, they take a look at the picture. There's not a craft, but there's an object, a small sort of star-shaped object about 30 or 40 feet over their, over their car. So that's, let's say that that's the object, but it projected an image of something else, and yet that's all they saw. So what, what happened? You know, it's sort of like they, it was a, a projected... 3D image of something, but it was only seen by them. So when you start to hear many of these cases, and Jacques Vallée talks about this a lot, that whatever these things are, seem to have the ability to project altered reality into people's minds. I know that sounds crazy, and I'm just repeating the stories. Well, no crazier than think. any other thing that we've been talking about. Right. I mean, it's all outside the bounds of what we understand as science anyway, right? Yeah. I mean, and, and I, have a, I have the picture of, that they took of that star-shaped object uh, and the story. And Jacques had been the person who went and did the interviews for it. And it, that was sort of a mind bender for me. The first time that I had seen uh, evidence of something that was different than what people had perceived, right? And so this notion of a projected reality is something that uh, really has to be part of the discussion at some point. So there have been uh, over centuries, many centuries, um, reports of livestock being killed, drained of blood mm -hmm. in conjunction with sightings of these objects. Right. Have you come across anything I, I mean, like that? I know of it, and I know the woman, uh, Linda Moulton Howe, who did a lot of these original studies. Uh, you know, again, it's, it's data. I, I don't know why anything would want to do that. Right. I, I really don't, um, and I don't know how it fits into the big picture uh, of this, um, because there's so many moving parts it's very hard to create a consolidated story about it. And, you know, the only way that I can create a consolidated story is to say that there's more than one thing here. Right. Right, that, and that these things are somehow in tension with each other. Uh, I mean, much like when the colonial Europe went around the world into Africa and India, et cetera, and basically were fighting each other, you know, England against Spain and France, et cetera, maybe that's a little bit about what we're seeing here is that these things are in some kind of tension with each other and that there is no uh, unifying motivation. Is there evidence that there's a lot of this kind of activity under sea? Yes. Yeah. I mean, plenty, right? The sonar images show these things moving at speeds a dozen times faster than our fastest submarines with no cavitation, right? No, you know, no basically bubbles behind them because the movement would create a vacuum and would, you know, basically make a giant bubble and... and We'd get this noise, no noise, just sonar images. So given your background in science, is that explicable? No. No, it's not. No. Okay. You have to imagine the new kinds of physics. But interestingly, the physicists have come up with a unifying, uh, let's say, mathematics for what these things might be doing and how they're doing it. Does it make sense to you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of them is called, it's, well, there's actually a, a Mexican physicist. He has worked out the equations for a warp drive. I mean, we can't do it. The amounts of energy required are extraordinary. It's called the Alcubierre drive. Uh, but then there's a number of other individuals who have then taken his equations and shown that, yeah, that it actually explains how these things might be moving. But there's a lot of data from underwater. Correct. But get that out of the Navy. And that's part of what the uh, announcement today was all about, this idea that Congress has said, enough is enough. We want the data. You're not going to hide this anymore. We're going to give uh, anybody in the entire DOD and intelligence community a secure channel by which you can actually report this. You can uh, basically set aside the NDAs or oaths that you've given because you're 
basically reporting to us, and it will be given to the Senate and the congressional leadership. Yeah. Right? And this is the first time ever that this has been done. It's about time. So, I mean, if, if anybody wants to question whether this is something to pay attention to, you have to realize that these are the senators and Congress people who, behind closed doors, have seen the classified briefings. Right? They're the people who've seen this in a way, they've seen stuff I haven't seen. And some of them come out and their eyes are wide. Yes. About this. Gary Reid of Nevada was yeah. and, constantly talking about it. Yeah. You know, and I actually uh, briefly, I, I briefed um, uh, Congressman Gallagher about this issue before he did the, uh, the uh, congressional uh, hearings on it about the, the Wilson Davis memo. Uh, and, you know, these people are taking it seriously, and you have to. Amazing. So tell us about the, the, the injuries. So, uh, mm -hmm. again, you've seen 100 cases. What kinds of injuries do people sustain? I think the most dramatic are, the, uh, because we have MRIs, um, the things that you see within the body. And so what we had done was, in looking at some of these MRIs, uh, we had noticed damage in the brain, white matter disease, it's called. Um, you know, if, if you know anybody, for instance, who's had uh, multiple sclerosis, mm -hmm. and you look at an image of their brain, you'll see these white matter objects. Oh, yeah, you can, yes, you can see it there. Those white tracts there are just damage to the brain, right? Those are dead areas of the brain. Uh, and so if you have that dead area of the brain, whatever that function might have been is now gone. Right, so memory, movement, et cetera, uh, can all be affected. Now, the brain can luckily rewire some things, and so depending upon the extent of the damage, you can maybe get over it. But you know, the ones that, you're just, that you just saw on that image before on the right, uh, those are serious. And that was what uh, essentially convinced me. But what I asked for of these people, I said, look, I'm not just gonna believe you because you showed me images of these people. I wanna meet the people. And so I was taken to meet the people and interview them. Uh, and I took their blood for later analysis. Uh, and uh, so, you know, it was seeing is believing and you know, validation and verification. I did as much as I reasonably can. Now, they could be lying to me. I don't know, but I doubt it because I saw some of the sort of the consequences of their injuries that, that you could sort of see how they were acting, et cetera. And did they describe the encounters that they had? Yeah. They did. And I shouldn't talk about some of them because some of those people's names have kind of become, uh, you know, uh, public. Uh, and so sort of HIPAA rules really of course. prevent me. But with, from, so without, without identifying them, yeah. um, what kinds of encounters did they have? Uh, objects on the ground with, that were, you know, glowing or, you know, moving too fast or they were there and they got too close to it and then it just disappeared. And then afterwards, they get, these, they get these radiation burns. Very often, some of them have been uh, basically on the skin, you see this uh, sclerosis of the skin, reddening inflammation of the skin. Uh, like a Nagasaki. Like a, a, exactly. Like a, so some sort of electromagnetic radiation, we imagine. Uh, but then it goes deep enough into some of their bodies, if they got too close, that would cause lasting scarring within the body, which is not something you ever want to have. Ah, and then the brain injuries. And the brain injuries. And the brain injuries were interesting because one of the things that we noticed in these individuals, and this is sort of a side study, which I'm working on with a group at Harvard, uh, is we noticed that an area of the brain, the caudate putamen, in many of these individuals was overdeveloped. Uh, and uh, that's a whole other story, but it basically we figured out that this is an area where intuition happens, and a lot of these individuals who we had were, it's called them, high functioning. You know, you, you don't get to be a pilot of an expensive right. craft without being reasonably smart and having intuition. Uh, and so um, just a side benefit of studying this allowed us to find a, come up with a medical uh, understanding of where cognition is happening in the brain, and we're following up with that in a mainstream science way with a neurophysiology group at Harvard. And we've validated the original findings. But that was sort of a, it's sort of an example of, because we paid attention to anomalous data, we found an, a, an anomaly that really had nothing to do with the injury in the first place, but it told us something about what makes people intuitive and smart. And that is going off in a mainstream direction. That's cool. Yeah. 
So was there consistency in symptoms? Yes. Yeah. I mean, so what were some it, of the symptoms? Inflammation, nausea uh, are the two most. I mean, if, if, if I irradiate you with a whole body irradiation, you're going to get sick, you're going to throw up, you're going to, depending upon which organ system was, let's say, most impacted directly, uh, you're going to basically have problems with that. But the, the commonalities were the skin issues uh, and then some internal uh, issues with the brain. I mean, when you see brain damage, that's when people start paying attention. It's hard to localize brain damage and, or damage in the rest of the body you know, and associate did, it with Did it. you see consistent cognitive symptoms? No. Okay. No, just, I mean, again, it's like in that image, depending upon where in the brain it happens, uh, where the damage happened to be caused, that function associated with that part of the brain would be hurt. Yeah, right? like scary. You know, arms not being able to move right. or, you know, walking, cognition. I Memory mean, loss, yeah. yeah. I don't remember ever reading about any of the survivors of Nagasaki or Hiroshima suffering mm -hmm. cognitive problems, brain damage. I would bet that there was. Okay, so, so, is this, yeah. so in other words, who that, was collecting data back then? Well, that's such a great point. <laughs> oh, right, that's exactly right. John Hersey, um, so th what the injuries you saw w are not inconsistent with like exposure to, nu to nuclear material. Correct, yeah. And, and so what that tells us is, I mean, at the very least what I would say is that, you know, let's say in the next round of UAP directives from Congress or from the Army or the Air Force is stay away. <laughs> stay away. You know, you see a glowing craft on the ground. Right. Don't I mean, approach. it seems obvious, but, you know, <laughs> I mean, some of the people who I know were so intrigued by what they were seeing, they felt that they had to walk up and touch it because this couldn't possibly be real. I mean, I would probably be in that category. Oh, me too. Oh, totally. You know, and, you know, and so you can kind of understand, but I mean, I think they, one of the directives is until we know what is going on, stay away. I mean, you know, for all so we know, put a warning label on UFOs. Yeah, yeah, I would. I, you know, <laughs> demand that they wear seat belts. <laughs> Did any of the people you interviewed? I, I just can't believe you've had this experience. I cannot. I was just to, just to back. Oh. Right, I can't believe you're, you're, you're in your office at Stanford. The CIA shows up. It is. Uh, it is out of a movie. It just yeah. turns your life in this amazing direction. But um, I wish that would happen to me. Did any of the people you interviewed see anybody in control of these craft? See any? Not in this, not in these cases, but I, in the injury cases, I do know of cases, non-injury associated, where things were seen. What kind of things? Uh, little beings. I, I don't know what to say. I know it sounds crazy. I'm I just, don't I'm know what to say. Know, like yeah. what, what the eyewitness accounts say. Yeah, the eyewitness you, You're accounts, not ratifying this. I'm not ratifying it. it. No, the Sorry. eyewitnesses always talk about something about that tall, right, with, you know, they call them the grays. I don't know what to but say. But with humanoid features. Humanoid features. Now, I have a problem with humanoid features because, you know, one of my backgrounds is evolutionary biology. Yes. And so I don't see the possibility of something else evolving on another planet that looks like us, you know, unless God is intervening in very specific yes. ways. Almost any thing an octopus could become intelligent and fly around the yes. universe. So I think that part of what we're seeing here, I mean look, if you're an intelligence, are you gonna go down on a planet with a bunch of angry monkeys who might kill you? No, unlikely. You'll send some intermediary. Well what kind of intermediary are you gonna send? You're gonna send something that maybe almost looks like them, but isn't them. So I think, and this is, again, from inside the intelligence community, most of what we think we're seeing are avatars, biological robots that are basically put there to be the minions, if you will. And that's, that's the current view of that's the intel a, community. That is a, it is a hypothesis. It's, I mean, to me, if I were going to another place, or if, if I were going to study a native tribe of, let's say, cannibals, maybe I wouldn't show up 
in the middle of their village so that I don't inadvertently become dinner. Yes. Right? So you would send an intermediary first. But I've used this example, uh, I, I don't know if you know Lex Fridman, you probably know Lex Fridman, the, he's an interviewer, does, he's an AI scientist at Stanford, I did one with him. And uh, using the example of the, of the ants as well, let's say that there were a race of intelligent ants at the bottom of your garden. How do you tell them about Instagram? Right? How do you talk with them? How do you interact with them? You would probably make something that looked almost like an ant, and you'd put it down there, but then how are you going to interact with them? Well, with pheromones, that's how they talk. But you do something else, right? You're, you're speaking about whatever it is you talk about at the dinner table, but you, to translate down to their terms, you would have to use some sort of an intermediary. So it's kind of a lost in translation problem, right? You, you want to put something there that can interact with them so that they can know that there's an object. But you, for instance, you're not going to show up and put yourself in danger. I wouldn't. I mean, we send drones. You, you understand uh, of what course, I mean? I'm, I'm, I'm tracking uh, intently. I just wonder if this has changed your perspective. It's ev changed everything. I look at everything now and wonder what's going on. But it also s sort of, b by comparison, makes a lot of the things that we debate or fret about seem pretty small. Right. You know, and, and I think Ronald Reagan had a conversation with Gorbachev back in the days of the Cold War, where he said at one point, if aliens showed up, would you work with us against them and drop the Cold War? I mean, that was, that's a recorded statement. He got in front of um, the UN and said something similar. And that all came from a sighting that he had had when he was uh, the governor of California, right? So basically what he was saying was something like this could bring us together. I mean, what law can you remember in the last year or two that has complete bipartisan support? This. Yes. Right? This has brought people together. And people say to me, well, why, why are you talking about it on this show or that show? I said, because this is above politics. Yes, it certainly is. It has to be. You know, and if we can't talk about this in a non-political way, then why are we bothering with anything? We might as well just silo ourselves and build walls around everybody. That's how I think about it. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And it's also inherently fascinating, but it, it raises, a lot of, raises a lot of questions, a lot of theological questions also, right. I would say. Yeah. Well, the Vatican is deeply involved yes. in trying to understand this as well. And the Vatican has already come out and said, if there are aliens... They can also be children of God. Yes. Right? There's no reason they can't be. Uh, there's no reason we can't treat them as, you know, as humans, if you will, even though they might not be. Right? That we need to treat them as equals because why not? They have no problem with it. And this is more, I mean, especially if you speak more with the Jesuits, right? The Jesuits are a little bit more amenable to this kind of thing. But the Vatican has come right out and said it. Well, they have their own observatory, I believe. Yeah, the, the Vatican Observatory the, and the Vatican Astronomer uh, has come out and said positive things. And they've been on this for a long time. Yeah. And, you know, there are rumors of stuff that's deep in the Vatican Library that uh, a good friend of mine, who you might want to eventually have on a show like this, is Diana Pasulka at the University of North Carolina. She's a comparative religion uh, professor. Fascinating uh, work. When you start asking the question, how will... Uh, the admission of that we are not at the top of the food chain anymore change all the religions, right? Because one of the first questions that somebody's going to ask is, okay, well, if they do show up and want to talk with us, who is their God? How do they see? Great question. You know, and so, and then everybody, every other religion will be looking for anything that anything like this says for a mirror of what they believe in. And it would just start a whole new series of arguments. So that is yet another thing, or another reason why the government might feel a little, uh, you know, hesitancy about bringing this kind of information forward. Oh, it's inherently destabilizing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sure, because if the U.S. military is not the most powerful force in the universe, then it kind of... Then we're, yeah. Yeah. Then, <laughs> resets your expectations. Then the populace might, you know, might, you know, revolt. <laughs> so... How were you treated at Stanford? Uh, you know, I think 
five, six years ago, there was a, a fair amount of giggling about it. But I, you know, I mean, I, I mean, luckily I have, you know, frankly, a really good reputation uh, as a serious scientist. I mean, like I said, I've, I've uh, commercialized a lot of the things. So I, and I've, you know, the stuff we do is, you know, cutting edge. I don't want to pat myself on the back too much. But um, it's, it's cutting edge. So people are like, okay, well, if, and so this is actually what's brought over some people is, is if Gary thinks this is real, maybe we should be paying attention to it. Well, here's an example. So I'll go give a talk in Boston and, you know, a bunch of professors uh, at, will you know, take me out to dinner. Inevitably, after one drink, this question comes up. I mean, and not to make fun of me, but to have a serious conversation. And almost inevitably, one of the group has said, yeah, well, I saw something when I was a kid. Right, or one of them comes up to me afterwards and says, "Gary, you know uh, this." Right, so if you give people permission in a place where they will not be ridiculed, you have a much more open conversation about a subject matter that's so important. And for many people, it, you call them experiencers, or you see something like that. I mean, I saw something when I was very young, when I was 12, as a paper boy, went right over my head. And what did you see? Where were you? This is Connecticut. What town? Uh, Windsor. I know it. Yeah, you went to Trinity. Outside Hartford, yeah. yeah. Windsor, uh, Windsor Locks. Windsor Locks. And uh, it was early in the morning. I was delivering newspapers. I was walking through the woods between one street and another. The Hartford Current? Hartford Current, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, and uh, uh, going from one street to another through the woods, and this, I saw the lights. It was like March. Uh, the tree branches and my shadow in front of me, and then the shadow started moving, and I looked up, and this object went, I mean, right at the level of the top of the trees, went right over my head. Uh, with lights shining down, it was, I could kind of see the outline of something round. Uh, How big no was it? No sign, probably 30, 40 feet across. Wow. And, I mean, it was unmistakable. I wasn't dreaming, I wasn't asleep, etc. but I didn't, call it a UFO, I didn't know what it was. I just didn't know what it was. And it wasn't until a decade or so later when, you know, you start seeing movies, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, that kind of stuff. I thought, is that what I saw? You know, you look back retrospectively and say... But you, you never know, forgot it. I never forgot. No, it's one of those moments. And that, yeah, thank you. That was actually the point I was, I was trying to get to. When you see something like that, you never forget it. It is... It is it changes your life. I hate to call it, it's almost like a spiritual experience. This is what Diana Pasolka writes about, that uh, professor I told you about. Um, and, and not that I'm not Christian or I'm, not, or I'm one thing or another, it's, it changes your life in a way that it puts things in perspective. So when you hear other people's stories about this stuff, I feel inherently like I want to protect them. Yes. I want to I want to help them not be attacked for something that they saw because it's wrong, first of all, that they shouldn't Absolutely be. Absolutely wrong. So you should, I sort of feel like we need to give people that open space. I mean, some of them might be delusional. Perfectly fine. Some of them might, but a lot of them are not, as you said at the beginning of the show, that there's any of a number of people who are otherwise credible, who are absolutely dead focused on this now. Um, and so... You know, through the efforts of Lou Elizondo and Chris Mellon and many others on the inside that unfortunately will not ever be known in the roles that they've played to bring this forward, they have given a level of credibility to this that has opened the area up for all kinds of people to move in. I mean, the, uh, the National Association of Aerospace Engineers now has a committee on this. It's a 50,000 strong or so uh, union of, of scientists. Right. NASA has come out and said that there you probably have seen this, that they're yes. studying it. Right. They're saying this is worth study. And they use the same language that we've been pushing. It's data. It's science. Scientists should be interested in things that they don't understand. And we shouldn't take anything off the table. Right. Doesn't Scientists should be interested in things they don't understand. Right? That's the whole point. That's the whole point of it. <laughs> it so that leads to the, the bigger and very obvious question, which is, how can we have a society in which many people have firsthand experience of these things, mm -hmm. in which 
mountains of data exist proving that there's something there that mm -hmm. we don't understand. And yet there's still this social sanction levied against anyone who mentions right. it. Right. Like, what is that? Well, I mean, it was, it was directed misinformation and disinformation. And so one of the things, you might want to look at the language of the, of the new um, bill that just came out today, literally, Lou sent it to me, you know, exclamation points, saying, we want you to catalog, you, the intelligence services, all the attempts at obfuscation and disinformation of the U.S. public that you have been doing. Beginning with Roswell. Beginning with Roswell, 1947. Right. Actually, there was a case two years before Roswell, but um, that is not very, really very well known. Um, Where was that? Trinity, actually. Uh, it was just it's very close to Roswell. Trinity, Trinity yeah. New Mexico? New Mexico, yeah. Um, interesting case. But, you know, w the reason why that's important is because, you know, people's lives were ruined. Right. People's careers were derailed. Uh, and, you know, it's not that we need to go back and fix all of that and, you know, come up with some kind of, you know, monetary compensation for those individuals. But I think vis-a-vis uh, -vis the PTSD issue, sometimes people just want to know that they weren't, that when they were called crazy, that somebody finally says you weren't. Of course. But going forward now, I mean, we might not be able to fix the past, but let's not recreate the past and the truth is forward. worth telling for its own sake yeah it's just it's a it's a virtue to tell the truth period and you know it's interesting i think you know i go around and i will talk to people about this issue so many people have not heard about this uh, that it kind of surprises me in a way because you know i would be interested in it but then i realized if it isn't affecting the bread and butter issues at their table every day why should they care right and and so um you know i i think that those of us who are in the middle of it need to realize that we do live in a bit of a bubble uh, and that the rest of the world is trying to just survive. And whether or not there are aliens or whatever, it's not going to change. When it changes their lives, then they might pay attention, right? So, I mean, it is still something which the public finds fascinating. And, you know, if you do a public survey of it, if you were to list that amongst the things that do you think this is interesting, people would check yes, it's interesting. But they aren't actively going out and seeking answers yet, except it's begun now to open up to the point where the government has said, yes, it's okay. Now scientists are saying, okay, it's okay now. So all the people who are kind of in the closet are now coming out. And but it's been it. almost 80 years. Yeah. And even before that, I yeah. mean, Pilots throughout the Second World War, they called them Foo Fighters. Yes, you know, right. right. So, um, so what we're seeing is this entire edifice of lies mm -hmm. starting to crack. Right. And clearly it's, it's coming down. But, you know, that disinformation manufactured by propagandists in the U.S. government mm -hmm. has been taken as truth for generations. Right. right. So knowing that, and that's, that's true, we know that. Yeah. Does it get you reassessing anything else we think we know? Uh, yes, in some way. <laughs> I mean, but, like, but if they I'm lied about sure, that, what else do they sure lie about? Want, I'm not so sure I want to say it here. <laughs> okay, that's an, I, I totally, I totally get it. Yeah. Um, but, but the answer, yes, is enough. So yes. it has. Yes, yes. <laughs> I think that the nature of our reality is uh, yet to be fully understood. <laughs> I think that's, you know, that there's a lot of things that people think are fringe that appear to have some evidence. And my interest, frankly, has been, can I place this fringe object in the mainstream of science, right? Can I, can I come up with some kind of explanation about how this weird stuff people think is happening can be real, right? Not that I have to believe it, but I, what I want to do is, is place it into our physics or find a bridge and a connection to it so that we can explain it. Now, what's good about all of these things is that money now is starting to appear, right? I mean, New Jersey actually now put out a, a postdoctoral fellowship for people to study UAPs, the state of New Jersey, right? I mean, I'm involved with, you know, trying to set up resources to be able to fund researchers for this kind of stuff because you know, scientists inherently will follow the money. I can't take my NIH dollars and go study UFOs, right? I mean, I have a certain box I have to stay in. Uh, but 
I do have money from uh, a, uh, an endowed chair that I have, uh, which is I can do anything I want with. It's $400,000 a year. And I have talked to the donors, and they're fine with me using some of this to study UFOs. Right? So I have the money to do it. I also spent a lot of money out of my own pocket on it. But now that there is going to be, uh, let's say, validation, you know, the National Science Foundation could get involved. The, you know, Lockheed might yes. want to do it. You know, one of the things that's actually in this, uh, in this um, new bill is calling for, I think they use the word, a cadre of academics and scientists who would advise the intelligence agencies on all of these issues, not just UAPs, but other things, for the first time, because there are so many barriers for this. But one of the things that I, I wrote a white paper for uh, some of these committees, um, and I called for that. I said, you know, you need to bring the scientists in. Not that we know better than anybody else, because most scientists can actually be dorks. Um, it's because you want that outside opinion. You want the crazy opinion, because you just want it on the table sometime, because it might yes. be true. And you know, when you do have a decision to make, you don't want it to be a political decision at some level. You want it to be science, and you want to use the best science to inform the politics and the policymakers so that they have the information at their disposal. But we don't have it yet. So now we do. Now it's starting to come. And it's literally in the bill today that says we will now try to establish and find ways to bring scientists on board in secure manners, right, with classified uh, access. Uh, because I don't want to give it to the Chinese. I certainly don't want to give it to the Russians. Yes. Right? So um, obviously this information has to be vetted, uh, whatever we might learn. Uh, and, but then at some level, though, you, you, you need to get the information out to academics because the silo approach of the last 80 years has not worked. Having one piece of it at Lockheed, having another piece of it over here, another piece of it over there, they can't talk to each other, right, by definition of how these things are set up. That isn't how a laboratory works. That isn't how science works. I need to know all this other stuff. Of course. And so we need to find a way to declassify enough things so that the collective smarts of the country can come to bear on it to hopefully use it. I mean, I, I come back to constantly, if there's something here, can we use it? And can we take advantage of it? Well, first for the country and then for the planet. That's just my interest. That's always been my approach to life. I think the most heartening part of this conversation, not only has been fascinating, but is the confirmation that science still exists, scientific thinking, the open-mindedness that science requires still exists. It's not all just superstition right. and reflexive political orthodoxy. So anyway, I'm just, I'm grateful that you're doing this. I'm grateful you're taking so seriously at Stanford. Yeah, and above thanks. all, I appreciate your telling us all this. Thank you Dr. very Gary much. Owen, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Amazing. Tucker Carlson, today is the name of the show. New episodes three days a week on Fox Station. Of course, every night, 8 p.m. We will see you on the Fox News channel. The whole subject matter is fascinating. Don't worry about, you know, Elizondo, the CIA whistleblower junk. And don't worry about he he actually changed his whole story. Did I tell you about this? I don't think so. He has a new thing now where it's like, you know, uh UFOs are not a national security threat. They're a national security concern. <laughs> so they've told him, take threat out of your language. You in the ideas room may have achieved this by us focusing on it. And the, the way that the ideas room has functioned around this, we may have single-handedly changed how the intelligence agencies are trying to promote a threat to humanity. That's the interesting thing that happens when people get together and work on these things. So, um, you know, if you get somebody who's operating for the CIA trying to create a threat program and i'm sure they're still at the threat program but they need to change the language so now it's a national security concern remember when we were talking with the ryan graves thing it was like oh they're they're concerned about national security you know there might be a safety issue it's not a threat 
it's now it's a concern and a safety issue. Well, because we exposed the threat, that's why. And, you know, I want to say this, that I think that people like Knapp and Dolan and these types of people promoted the CIA people who were giving us the threat thing. So I'm disappointed in them. I don't think that, you know, that means they're terrible people, but I'm disappointed they gave a platform to the, to the Stars Academy ripoff. And people like Kane and all the rest of it, they created this thing. So I think there should be, you know, a real communication about this, which is I don't think that people need to fall for that. You know, we're not children and you can't, you know, we want to know if intelligence people are involved in buttering us up, you know, about disclosure, because we don't want the CIA involved in UFO disclosure. I think it's a pretty fair position, actually. And I think that's something that everyone can shake hands on, actually. Uh, so, and I would agree with the idea that, you know, there's no point in fighting about it. And what's interesting is the CIA are masters at dividing people who agree upon certain things. So what you want is to call it out, you know? So when I do that, I'm doing it as a reporter. I'm saying CIA people got involved in the UFO field and UFO field researchers let them, which means they let their audience down. So that's important. So those people, you know, they can do what they want and researchers have to go their own way or whatever. And if they think, well, it's better to be in with the CIA because eventually I'll get some tidbit of knowledge or they'll give me a show kickback. <laughs> like, you know, so you're going to choose whatever you want to choose in life, but let's get real about what it is. So don't, you know, uh, don't give me John Ramirez or uh, Jim Semivan or who's the other one? <laughs> There's the third one. Uh, you know, don't give me those guys as contactees. You know, if the CIA is selling, I'm not buying. So let's move on to real stuff because the real stuff is so much better than any kind of whirly gig weirdo CIA stuff. Hey, those guys are so guilty from assassinating president 60 years ago. They can't even give you records. Why are they going to give you the UFO truth? It's not going to happen. So let's get real about it. You know, uh, study the deep state. You'll understand who you're dealing with with intelligence agencies. And, you know, it'll make them respect you because they'll be like, oh, you know, we can't fool these people. Let's move on. Let's not use threat. Let's use safety. <laughs> and uh, that's important. I think that's important. So uh, that's people also looking out for each other around these very sensitive topics. And a lot of very sensitive people get involved with the topics, too. That's what I find. They're some of the most sensitive people. Um, that's one of the characteristics of contactees, interestingly enough. So with all that said, Miss Olivia, super chatters. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I actually have a couple of things to report on, on the UFO file side and, um, something extraordinary did happen there. And I still feel like this is their chief aim in terms of emergency powers and the things that they're trying to put forward, but they've had a lot of problems uh, on the intelligence side pushing for the UFO threat op, but they've got themselves into trouble by the characters that they've used uh, that we've highlighted on this program, counterintelligence people um, who I think they can, you know, they're constantly repackaging and their packaging might just be getting stale at this point, but something interesting came up. The same people, um, earlier on mm -hmm. in uh, 2017 that brought us this UFO file threat action and the whole 2017, oh, you know, we have a new UFO thing and the New York Times is covering it and UAP and all this stuff. So that whole group, the CIA counterintelligence group, Elizondo Mellon and uh, Jim Semivan is a 25 year lifer there at the CIA. They came out, um, with that December 16th, 2017. And it's interesting because the New York Times was the conduit. Now, here we are just a couple months shy of their five-year anniversary of launching this thing. And uh, they've done a lot to kind of muddy the waters. They've done a lot to launch a UFO threat and seize emergency powers and things of this nature and to create this whole kind of false disclosure idea away from the genuine research around UFO files, two very, very different things. New York Times article today 
Uh, many military UFO reports are just foreign spying or, watch closely, airborne trash. That's the actual headline from the article. And um, this is fascinating, their foreign policy correspondent. And this basically takes the New York Times off the hook for the junk conspiracy that they promoted with the Elizondo and TTSA and all that. This is their response. And I'll tell you, the fact that they use the word trash in there means they're, they're trashing. <laughs> and the old op is trash, basically. So the change in tone there, we have to be uh, very aware of because earlier we had the UFO threat thing going full force, launched by the New York Times, through Fox TV, CNN, Politico, you know, and now all the same people are emerging and they're changing that message. They're promoting Ryan Graves, who's a Navy pilot, and they're promoting uh, Gary Nolan, who's a big Fauci immunologist uh, over there at Stanford. And he's also a contactee, by the way. I'm going to buy that one. Now, um, but what's particularly interesting to me is this Elizondo piece that came out. Now, remember, he was the big one on the UFO threat thing, which was supposed to be, oh, the UFO threat is here, so you need to give us all your power and create this office of UFO defense and all this kind of thing. Well, now, check out the change in tone from a recent Lou article. Uh, and so this, they're talking about a man who once headed a little-known government program to gather and analyze information about UAP said that he has changed in the last four years, and now the United States has admitted to the clandestine program, and now that many government personnel are required to report UAP sightings through official channels. Uh, so there's this whole buildup of him as this former official who formerly led this thing. First of all, he's not former anything, as I've pointed out. He still works for the Pentagon. He did then. He did in between. He does now. So there's no former Pentagon whistleblower or anything. But what's interesting is, listen to the change in tone. Think about that trash thing. <laughs> Keep that in the back of your mind. Now this. This is Elizondo. We're here today because your government is now taking this as a national security issue. Not a national security threat, but a national security issue. Now, he has backed off the threat language because... You know, we in the media and the alternative media have exposed them. A very small corridor of us have done that. And you in the ideas room have mm -hmm. spread that message. But you can see that part of it, they need to kind of recalibrate. And so now they're really hot to trot on the Amuamua AI thing and Gary Nolan and uh, our old, good old Abby Loeb over there at Harvard. Now, Amuamua, of course, means scout, scout ship. And the idea is that big... Uh, rock that came in from another galaxy was a ship and it's trying to communicate AI to us saying planet earth don't destroy yourself uh, develop carbon uh, taxes for your citizens <laughs> and this is where they're going with that one so they they want to um, formulate this but when we see the change now in the New York Times itself that you know airborne trash that's that's what they're thinking of their old op now uh, that's a very significant shift. And then when you see the counter intel shift from Elizondo, you know, the CIA puppet boy for 20 years, he's running around. Now he's saying it's not a threat. It's what? It's a national security issue. And what does Ryan Graves say? The latest one who came through Leslie Kane, who has been around there in that UFO world uh, for a while. And she helped launch, she wrote the article for the New York Times that launched all this nonsense. What does Ryan Graves have to say? Well, he says, well, it's not a threat issue. You know what it is? It's a safety issue. We're not safe when we're flying around. There are UFOs up there too. So now they're switching that. And you know how they always work it out? Well, you know, the COVID restrictions are for your safety. <laughs> the vaccine's for your safety and all these different means. So now they have safety and science, right, with Gary Nolan. So um, watching how they piece these things together and really taking a look at the train tracks of how, you know, these things map out together is crucial. I wanted to point out that there is a theme going on here, which is, you know, Elizondo was supposed to have a bio movie and a book out by now. And yeah, what I, happened to that? I was looking forward to seeing it, <laughs> <laughs> especially the poor whistleblower comes forward. Um, and uh, so all those things are shelved. I guess uh, Greenwald from the Black Vault went ahead and got in touch with the publishing company and said, is this thing you know, coming out because I want to review it? And they said, well, there's no release date 
for this stuff. I find that interesting. Um, this was interesting to me. Now, this is um, Leslie Kane, who uh, was Bud Hopkins' partner, and Bud Hopkins did fantastic work in abductions. And then when she does all this work with these CIA people, she never mentions Bud Hopkins and the great work that he did. So that's strange. Um, and I have to just, you know, on the record, say that her governor, uh, her uncle is the governor of New York, uh, of New Jersey, Thomas Kane, and he was the head of the 9-11 commission. So, you know, we have to kind of instantly, there's a political piece to this. You know, she's connected to that whole uh, political gang and that's all right. You know, you can be born into that and be interested in UFOs, but when you start doing things and it becomes very convenient for intelligence agencies to use you as their prop person, then it becomes a different story. Then, you know, in investigative reporters are going to look a little bit more de decently at it. Uh, and also, you know, I've invited these people uh, for gentlemen's debate on this show before. So it's not like I, I just want to dialogue about them. Uh, but there's a good reason why they're not going to come on. But anyway, this is very interesting about Leslie Kane. So the series that she put together was her and Elizondo and it was all this thing and it was UFO and CNN and all this stuff. And then suddenly they just dropped it. And so you started hearing all these announcements. Oh, there are delays. Don't worry about it. You know, don't worry about it. Now she, she has to come forward and say something. So on her public Facebook, she writes, our CNN series on UAP is on hold only because of the upheaval caused by the merger of HBO and CNN. There's a restructuring. People are getting fired. Budgets are changing. There is only one reason for the delay, and our series is not the only one facing this frustrating set of circumstances. There is no conspiracy, exclamation point. <laughs> um, I found that very, very interesting because these projects now, the CIA has withdrawn their support. The establishment has withdrawn their support because they can't accomplish the same things using players like this. They had guys like Elizondo out there going into interviews with people on podcasts. And then when they said something that he didn't appreciate, you know, he would say, Oh, your mom's a hooker or whatever, <laughs> you know? So they had these loose cannons and it wasn't working. Now they're trying this kinder, gentler Lou. Uh, and they've got Dr. Nolan, big Fauci supporter saying I was an abductee and the whole, so the CIA wave has reset itself um, from UFO threat to UFO safety. This is interesting. Uh, I think they will revert back to threat because it's their best card. But nonetheless, uh, that wave is something that we keeping a very close eye on. And uh, Nolan, in particular, you would say in terms of the UFO op launched by the intelligence agencies, of which he is a part of the CIA, admitted. And you know that's not it's not one of those things that's debatable. It's in his bio. You know, CIA guy. Got it. <laughs> uh, and I do find that interesting. It's a weird reluctance. Like, no, no, he's not CIA. Yes, yes, he is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, you know, it was interesting, I would say, back in the past, the CIA used to use people and they'd use authors and they used other people and they wouldn't say, hey, you know, don't disclose your connection to the CIA. Now they're all tied in there. So